I was invited by Sandy and Heather to speak for today's SRF's monthly Zoom meeting. Uh, to start, I want to briefly give some background about myself. I graduated from Cal Poly Pomona in 2022 with a bachelor's in biotechnology um, and a minor in chemistry. After graduating, I underwent stem cell training in the Keck Biotechnology program at Pasadena City College. I'm currently a California Institute of Regenerative Medicine Bridges System Cell Research uh, Therapy intern. And I am interning at USC in Dr. Georgia Quadrado's lab. The Quadrado lab focuses on neurodevelopmental disorders. And I began my time in the lab working closely with Ashley Del Dosso, a senior PhD candidate, and Marcella Bertel, a postdoc fellow, on their project in which they were utilizing brain organoids as a disease model for Syngap 1 syndrome. Uh, today, I'm here to present about the project that I've been working on in the Quadrata Lab. So the title of today's talk is Autism Associated Genes in GAP1 Regulates Human Cortical Neurogenesis. So to start, there are many genetic mechanisms underlying neurodevelopmental disorders. From what we understand about neurodevelopmental disorders is that they commonly stem from polygenic mutations and can present with an array of symptoms as well as variations in severity. This indicates that the genetic background is an important factor when investigating the mechanisms of these diseases. Because of polygenetic disorders, it is important to understand the effects these disorders have on the human genetic background, which is why there is in such an important need for a human model. Um, and of course, modeling the entire genetic background of a patient in a mouse model is impossible. But another thing to consider is when modeling neurodevelopmental disease is where in the brain these behavioral and intellectual deficits associated with neurodevelopmental disorders arise. They are largely related to the prefrontal cortex, which is a region specific to higher order mammals that regulates many of our most human traits such as attention, emotional responses, and executive functions such as reward and motivation. This particular region is greatly reduced in the rodent, making it difficult to rely only on rodent models to investigate neurodevelopmental disorders, which have a profound effect on the specific region of the brain. For obvious reasons, we cannot perform molecular and cellular assays on the human brain. Studying the human brain itself would be the most accurate, but there are considerable ethical limitations in doing so, as well as postmortem human brain tissue that is av uh, available to be studied from embryonic stages is very limited and it only provides a snapshot of the developmental stages and omits the ability to do in-depth functional characterization. So therefore there is an obvious need for a human specific model of brain development. Uh, brain organoids have recently become a promising system for modeling human specific processes involved in the early stages of brain development. And while they don't necessarily recapitulate the size and intricate anatomy of the developing brain, they have been shown to reliably generate a diverse range of cell types that emerge in a sequence similar to what is seen at the different de de developmental stages of, the, of human brain development. And eventually these cells are able to form networks capable of producing electrical activity. So here on this slide, I'm showing a non-patient and a autism spectrum disorder patient um, in which a skin biopsy is performed to obtain skin cells. And from these skin cells, they can be cultured into fibroblasts and then reprogrammed into induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, it, they're reprogrammed to have pluripotency, which basically refers to the capacity in which a cell that is able to develop into many different types of cells or tissues in the body. Uh, and from these induced pluripotent stem cells, we can then generate brain organoids. So before getting into the nitty gritty of like the brain organoids that um, and how we use them in the lab to invest in gates, SYNGAP1 syndrome, you're probably wondering like, what is a brain organ or what is an organoid? Um, organoids are cultured from stem cells and form three dimensional structures that mimic the organ, including multiple cell types, protein expression, functions such as absorption, barrier function, and nutrient uptake. To put simply, an organoid is a mini organ that is um, that is generated in vitro with the ability to self-renew and self-organize. And these organoids are able to perform organ functions similar to those of the tissue of origin. 
Self-organization within the organoid occurs through spatially restricted lineage commitment and cell sorting, which requires activation of various signaling pathways, which is mediated by intrinsic cellular components or extrinsic cellular environments, uh, such as extracellular matrix and the type of growth factors used in the media. Thus, through these patterns, uh, uh, thus, through these patterning strategies, we've been able to direct the differentiation of these stem cells toward the recapitulation of diverse organ types. And some examples of organoids, um, as seen on the slide, are include liver, stomach, intestinal, kidney, lung, and brain. Um, organoids are becoming one of the mainstream cell culture tools in many biomedical studies. The wide range of tissue types, the long-term ex expansion capacity, and the physiological 3D architecture of organoids make them a powerful new technology for many biological and clinical applications. Notably, organoids have been widely used for development and disease modeling, precision medicine, toxicology study, and regenerative medicine. So looking more specifically at brain organoids, brain organoids are models used to study human neurogenesis. Um, human brain organoids are composed of masses of neural cells that may be organized in a manner resembling brain tissue. And although they are self-organizing, we supplement with extrinsic patterning factors to induce a neuroectodermal fate. Uh, there are obvious differences, as seen on the slide, between a human brain organoid versus a human brain an actual human brain, such as the anatomy and size. And it's important to note that brain organoids are reductionists. They are missing like many important vascular immune cells as well. They, they are obviously a lot smaller and less organo uh, organized compared to an actual human brain. So despite differences, there are many similarities at the cellular and molecular level. Main similarities include same cortical cell types, uh, same neuronal activity and same developmental stages. These developmental stages include like neuroproliferation, neurodifferentiation, neuro, neuronal migration, and synapse formation. Uh, and the major difference would be the size and anatomy, as I previously mentioned. So induced pluripotent stem cells are aggregated to form an emperor body and then patterned to induce a neuroectoderm fate. Um, from the induced pluripotent stem cells, they self-pattern into three-dimensional uh, three dimensional multicellular neural tissues with defined compartments, including radially arranged neural tube-like uh, neural epithelial structures in an immature cortical plate. So in this image here on the left is showing uh, an example of an organoid, and on the right is showing an example of the brain. And so this is showing cortical neurogenesis occurring. Um, and the purple would represent radial glia. Radial glia cells are ubiquitous precursors that generate neurons and glia, and they are key elements in patterning and region-specific differentiation of the central nervous system. Radial glia are multipurpose cells involved in most aspects of brain development. The blue um, in the human brain and in the organoid represent progenitor cells and progenitor cells are cells that can only differentiate into target their target cell type the brown would be outer radial glial cells light green are migrating new uh, newborn neurons and the dark green and darker red uh, are more mature neuron and the yellow are astrocytes so we're looking at the development of human brain organoid cultures over time Brain organoids have come a long way over the past decade, and there now exist many protocols that vary in the amount of initial patterning to either uh, produce more discrete brain regions or organoids that have characteristics of the whole brain. In addition, there are also many studies that have shown integration of cell types for non-ectodermal lineages, such as microglia and vascular endothelial cells as a means to make this model more physiologically uh, relevant. Um, for this specific project, we have chosen to produce brain organoids that are reminiscent of the dorsal forebrain for our research, which is a critical region in neurodevelopmental disorders. So how are brain organoids generated in our lab? So to generate induced pluripotent stem cell derived dorsal forebrain organoids, we use the recently published Velasco protocol, which 
specifies organoid fate to the dorsal forebrain. This protocol reliably produces neuroectodermal derived neurons and glia of the dorsal forebrain, recapitulating early stages of human development, specifically the second trimester. However, as I previously met previously mentioned before, um, this is a reductionist system. It lacks microglia and blood vessels. Um, it, while, while it does lack these things, it does provide a diverse population of cells not seen in 2D cultures. Um, and then looking at the cellular and molecular phenotypes of SYNGAP1 mutations, they consist of a accelerated neuronal maturation, hyperexcitability in neuronal circuits, and deficits in long-term potentiation. So long-term potentiation refers to a process involving persistent strengthening of synapses that leads to long-lasting increase in the signal transmission between neurons. It is an important process in the context of synaptic plasticity. So uh, on the image to the um, right, this, the ca canonical molecular roles of SYNGAP1 take place within the postsynaptic density. Here, SYNGAP functions as both a scaffolding and signaling protein. Um, in the postsynaptic density, it is known to modulate RAS activity by facilitating the exchange of GDP for GT, uh, GTP for GDP, turning off the RAS pathway and leading to downstream changes in dendritic spine maturation uh, and neuronal excit excitability and deficits in the long-term potentiation. So while the role of SYNGAP in the postsynaptic density of mature synapses has been the focus of research in this field, there are several lines of evidence that point to SYNGAP1 having an earlier, uh, a role in earlier stages of neurogenesis, including migrations of inhib inhibitory interneurons uh, in cell death and in proliferation dynamics. So for the generation of brain organoids for this project, um, the COBA lab has shared a patient-induced pluripotent stem cell line with my lab, as well as a CRISPR-corrected isogenic control generated by Brent, who is a former postdoc in the COBA lab. This patient has a truncating mutation within the RASGAP domain, leading to that haplo insufficiency of SYNGAP1 uh, via premature stop, stop code DON. Uh, clinically, this patient presents as having microcephaly and, and severe intellectual disability. Most effective individuals have de novo mutations with truncating mutations predominating, although missense mutations, chromosomal translocations, or microdeletions disrupting SYNGAP1 are also described. Um, so SYNGAP1 is expressed in human radioglia progenitors and co-localizes with tight junction uh, protein. So again, reiterating, human radioglia are the precursors that generate neurons and glia, um, and they're key elements in patterning and region-specific differentiation of the uh, central nervous system. Um, in this image to the left, I, uh, we show that SYNGAP1 is co-localized with uh, TJP1, which is a tight junction protein, which we confirm through immunoprecipitation. Tight junction protein uh, establishes a link between the transmembrane protein occlid occludin and the actin cytoskeleton. Uh, occludin plays a role, a critical role in maintaining the barrier properties of a tight junction, and the actin cytoskeleton is important for maintaining the shape and structure of cells, as well as for essential processes such as cell migration, uh, intra or extracellular trafficking, and cell-to-cell -cell interactions. Uh, so we also saw that SYNGAP seemed to be co-localizing with the apical envy of nestin positive radioglia. Nestin is a marker for neural stem cells. Um, and this all seems to indicate that SYNGAP1 may have a potential role in establishing or maintaining the integrity of the ventricular wall, which is an area that dictates progenitor dynamics. So uh, we performed a bulk uh, bulk RNA sequence of day seven embryo bodies and found that many of the genes differentially expressed are related to the cytoskeleton. Cytoskeleton refers, uh, has the responsibility of providing rigidity and shape to a cell, and it's important in facilitating cellular movements. 
We also performed immune precipitation of Syngap, and we found that many of the interactors of Syngap were cytoskeletal protein. Uh, we therefore wanted to look at the effect of this mutation in cytoskeleton dynamics and found that ventricle formation was impaired. So we used a single rosette system, uh, which refers to a, a single neuro rosette, and it's a flower-shaped clump of stem cells that recapitulate the neurotube. Um, so in the control rosettes, uh, in the very top image right here, you can see nice radial alignment of actubulin fibers around the empty space for the ventricle. Um, however, this, this, this is disrupted in the patient organoids. This is the patient organoids right here. Um, does someone have their hand up? I can answer questions either now or at the end. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, I just want to make sure these are full. It looks, it's more clear on this one, but these are full uh, organoids, right? Uh, so this is a rosette. So it's not a full organoid. So it's just a- Can you a, describe a rosette and also what, what it was in the co-localization? Like, what were we looking at in the co -local? Was that cellular or was that um, so tissue? This, is this sort of like tissue level? Uh, this is an organoid, so this is tissue level. Um, this here is the rosette, which is uh, a rosette specifically refers to like a, a clump of uh, neuro cells come together to recapitulate the neuro tube. So it's not a full on organoid quite yet. Okay, but it's on its way. Is it early yeah. in it or is it just like yeah, a so different this, thing that you get after? Uh, so it, time? It, this is early on. So this would okay. be day seven. Uh, okay, so it's mm -hmm. forming a neural tube and then it's going to do other stuff. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, as I was saying, like in the control compared to the patient, you can see that the alignment of the actubulin fibers are disrupted in the patient organoids. Actubulin is a cytoskeletal protein and a major component of microtubules, and it plays a crucial role in the regulation of cell shape, intracellular transport, cell motility, cell migration, and cell division. Uh, we further looked at it in a RASGAP dead stem cell line, bottom image, um, as well as additional control line, and we saw major impairments indicating the RASGAP domain is important for this function and that it is the mutation itself um, and not the genetic background responsible for this phenotype, uh, which is interesting given that mature neurons um, uh, with syngas involvement in the cytoskeletal reorganization is regulated through its RASGAP domain. So I, I'm because, sorry, can, yeah. can you explain again what the, what you put back in? What's the RGD? What did you exactly put back in? So this is the RASGAP dead stem cell line. Um, it is uh, basically the uh, one of an additional line uh, showing the deficiency with the mutation with RASGAP dead. Uh, sorry. Okay, so um, because we saw such disorganization in the single rosette model, we wanted to know how these disruptions would affect cortical genesis. So the, the images you're seeing here are three month old organoids. And we found disruption in the cortical plate layering and organization um, in which we found neurons present at the ventricle and not were organized. Um, in the top figure, the three month old organoids were stained with SOX2 and which is a marker for multipotential neurostem cells. We measured and compared the thickness of the ventricular zone, which appears green and found that the corrected organoids displayed greater thickness compared to the patient organoids. In the bottom figure, uh, the three-month-old organoids were stained with SOX2 and MAP2. MAP2 is a marker for neuronal differentiation, and we were able to compare the organization of the ventricles and found that they were not well organized compared to the corrected organoids. Um, and it should be noted that the disruption of the ventricular zone is exasperated in organoids and is not well compensated for when compared to human brain, as well as in the mouse model, there are no visible abnormalities to the brain, um, rather just slightly microcephal microcephalic, excuse me. I just want to reiterate that the disrupted organoids seen here are not indicative at all of how an actual human brain looks like with Syngap-1 syndrome. Um, so the disorganized progenitor regions and the neuronal layering sparked our interest in getting a closer look at the dynamics of proliferation and differentiation. Uh, we began this by doing pulse chase experiments with BRDU, uh, which is a thi thymidine 
analog that incorporates DNA of dividing cells during the S phase of the cell cycle, we saw that there were more uh, BRDU SOX2 uh, positive cells in the corrected and control lines and more BRDU new and positive cells in the patient and mutant lines, indicating that the patient mutant and the mutant cells are differentiating more rapidly. Uh, and new and is just a marker for mature neurons. So to further investigate the alteration and division mode of SYNGAP1 radioglia, we assess the differentiative versus self-renewing divisions occurring at the ventricular wall based on the cleavage planes here seen in this figure, either vertical, oblique, or horizontal. And we saw an increase of differentiative divisions as opposed to self-renewing uh, divisions in the patient line. Um, and to look at this on a larger scale and with finer resolution, we did single cell RNA sequencing. Single cell sequencing examines the sequence information from individual cells with optimized next-gen sequencing technologies. And it provides a higher resolution of cellular differences and a better understanding of the function of an individual cell in the context of its microenvironment. At the top figure on the right is a UMAP, and UMAP is an algorithm for dimension reduction based on manifold learning techniques and ideas from topological data analysis. Um, this shows reproducibility across them, which allows for us to look at statistically significant differences between the patient line and the control line. Um, we were specifically curious about uh, the apical radi radial glia, which are the proliferating cells lining the wall of the ventricle. And by looking at single cell data, we were able to identify several pathways indicating downregulation of proliferation and upregulation of differentiation, confirming the previous findings. Um, and to look at how this dysregulation in, in, in proliferation and differentiation affects total radioglia in the neuronal population, we analyzed the total number of um, SOX2 um, and new and positive cells relative to DAPI. DAPI is a marker used to uh, identify all cells in the organoid. Again, SOX2 is a marker for multi-potential neurostem cells, and NUIN is a marker for post-mitotic or mature neurons. Um, and in vitro, it shows there is a reduction in SOX2 and SYNGAP1 organoids, and an increase in NUIN positive cells, indicating an asynchronous cortical neurogenesis occurring. And we saw, also saw this uh, in vivo as well in mice brains. Uh, the brain of Syngap1 head and knockout mice have an earlier depletion of the progenitor pool around the lateral vent ventricle, as well as earlier production of neurons shown in the cortical plate. Um, so it indicates this, uh, this asynchronous cortical uh, neurogenesis is seen in vitro and in vivo. So lastly, we wanted to see if this premature differentiation uh, that we were seeing was linked with a more mature neuronal phenotype as well as um, Excuse me, sorry. Um, so this analysis was headed by a postdoc in our lab, Marcella, um, and the go terms pulled from single cell clusters for cortical fugal, fugal projection neurons and colossal projection neurons additionally indicated a more mature state. Um, uh, on the left, um, this figure shows dendritic spinal analysis, which shows an increased complexity in the patient neurons, indicating a more mature state. As, and finally, functional analysis was done by using calcium imaging to record spontaneous neuroactivity. Um, here, the patient organoids had an increase uh, uh, in network bursts and faster transient and coordinated bursts, confirming a more uh, mature functional state. Overall, we see an increase in structural and functional maturation. So in summary, uh, the work I presented you, to you today is centered around our new discovery of the expression of a known synaptic protein SYNGAP1 in human radioglia progenitors. Uh, I think this work is groundbreaking as it reframes our understanding toward the idea that well-known synaptic proteins are expressed and might have a specific function in early development. This is our particularly important in the context of neurodevelopmental disorders and their possible pharmacological 
pharmacological treatment. Um, so we have demonstrated for the first time SYNGAP1 expression in human early neuroprogenitor cells, as well as we discovered a role for SYNGAP1 in regulating actin-based cytoskeletal dynamics in neuro neuronal progenitors. And so ongoing work in future directions. Ongoing work is focused on addressing the role of SYNGAP1 in distinct subtypes of cortical progenitors and how disruption of this may lead to clinical phenotypes observed in humans. Um, we understand that SYNGAP1 mutation phenotype is not shaping the brain's actual development. Uh, the brain does not show major abnormalities. However, the symptoms from SYNGAP1 primarily manifest epilepsy. Some future directions include investigating the role of SYNGAP1 in progenitors from other brain regions, such as the cerebellum, as well as um, the SRF grant uh, that is being headed by our postdoc, Marcella, to better understand SYNGAP1 interactors in progenitors in which uh, high throughput screening uh, will be performed in early human cortical progenitors derived from SYNGAP1 patients with different pathogenic variants. The results will enable the stratification of SYNGAP1 mutations according to their effects on human cortical neurogenesis and help guide uh, future therapeutic approaches. Um, so what does this mean for SYNGAP1 syndrome? So of course, from what we know now, a pharmacological treatment of the main symptom, um, epilepsy, uh, early screening means early treatment. There is potential therapeutics to treat SYNGAP1 syndrome through the use of antisense oglier nucleotides to upregulate um, production of SYNGAP1 protein and therefore potentially downregulate the severity symptoms. Um, as of right now, ASO therapies are currently being developed for Dravet syndrome. Um, so hopefully down the line in the future, they can be developed for SYNGAP1. Um, and lastly, um, I just wanna say thank you. I'm very thankful to, been have, to have been allowed to work on this project. I wanna thank my fellow lab members listed here, but especially Ashley and Marcella for allowing me to join their project and being so gracious with their time and energy and teaching me and guiding me throughout my internship this far, as well as a big thank you to uh, my PI, Dr. Quadrado, for fostering such a welcoming lab environment where I have really grown as a scientist and researcher uh, this past year. Learning about SYNGAP1 syndrome and just becoming more aware of it has made me very passionate in doing this research. Um, and uh, even though um, I, I will continue my time in the lab as a master's student, so I am committed to moving forward the research of SYNGAP1 and hope to continue to just spread awareness about SYNGAP1 syndrome within the scientific scientific community as interest continues to grow more and more, as well as thank you to Sandy for onboarding me as a volunteer for SRF and connecting me with Heather, and then also just inviting me to talk for this monthly Zoom meeting. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I have learned a lot as an intern in the Quadrilateral Lab this past year, so I'll, I'll do my best to answer your questions. There, we have some questions in the chat, but I believe some of your colleagues and friends have yes. answered a few yeah. of them. So just to yeah. clarify, make sure they're all answered. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think Ashley pretty much answered those, some prim primarily most of the questions. Um, I've seen in the chat. Does anybody Hi. else have any other questions for Sarah? Maybe understanding more of what she said in a different way or um, about future work? Yeah, this is JR. I have some questions, but I want to make sure other people get a chance to ask first. Does anybody have any questions besides me? Oh. I am just going to try to summarize with my own understanding, which is very um, premature <laughs> about this topic. So bear with me. From what I heard you say, is this correct? Is my question that um, you, the lab is studying organoids um, for obvious reasons, because it's not possible to study the brain itself. Mm -hmm. And you noticed that there was a change in the organoids. Is that correct? Yeah. Like through uh, studying them? 
Yeah, so with the organoids, we're able to um, basically use it as a model to study how the, the, the SYNGAP1 syndrome um, affects the development of the organoid um, to try to recapitulate of how it would be in a human brain. Of course, these are not like perfect. Um, it's, uh, it's, we can't necessarily, um, it, it, as I previously mentioned, it is a reductionist system. Um, these brain organoids don't necessarily have the same capacity nor plasticity compared to a human brain, um, but it does give us many diverse cell types that we haven't been able to research in 2D structures. Thank you for clarifying and, that for me. And so, and when you do an organoid, um, you have one with Syngap, so it's like one of the, just like a specific mutation, right? Yeah. So, okay. So just like each of the kids that are, have a different, so, uh, yeah. Uh, and then um, if there are therapy, it can like therapies be, uh, yeah, I guess so. You, you can throw therapies at them, right? Or, or, or mm -hmm. potential, okay. So is that like a next step is to, I mean, or once you guys are prepared or maybe your lab or other labs, once there are therapeutics mm -hmm. to look at, we could look at them on the organoids. Yeah, potentially, definitely. They uh, Organoids not just have the ability to be used for disease modeling, but also um, to I, like prior to clinical trials to, um, I guess, go through or like be put through the therapeutics to see how uh, the organoids respond. How long does it take to grow a brain organized? Um, so let me just go back in the slide. Sorry, I'm sure it was no, there. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. I didn't explain to in depth the, the process of uh, developing an organoid. So it takes about um, 18 days um, to develop an organoid where we can remove it from. So initially, we seed the cells in the 96 well plate. And we continue to feed them every three days in the 96 well plate. And then after day 18, we're able to remove these organoids from uh, the 96 well plate and transfer it to uh, like a 10 centimeter Petri dish uh, where they continue to be fed media. Uh, but from then they're like free suspended and they continue to grow um, up to 90 days. And we have organoids like even past that as well. And then they live for a while or? Um, uh, pretty much, yeah. Um, they live for a while, like as right now, the organoids that we have in culture, um, I have ones that are, are as old as like five month old. Um, okay. Yeah. Interesting. So you're basically feeding it little, little fat to keep them. Yes. So, yeah. Oh, we, okay. We, like, yeah. <laughs> uh, we feed them, it's called media. Um, and it's supplemented with different uh, nutrients, liquid nutrients. Um, and we, uh, once they reach a certain age, uh, we can we feed them like once a week, and we just replenish. We take out some media and replenish with some fresh media. If that makes sense. So bizarre. Anybody else besides Thanks. JR? Have any questions? This is great, thank you. It was definitely very thorough. Um, JR, go ahead with your questions. Hey, thank you, Sarah. That's a lot of work and it was really amazing um, to see the gap in the, in the glia, so thank you. Um, yeah, Ashley answered my question about the RGD. It's a point mutation, single mm -hmm. point. And so I guess it, it doesn't do the ERK signaling. Is that right? Um, that I'm not confident in answering. Ashley might be more confident in answering yeah, that. Yeah, that's, pr that's more probably knowledgeable. It. That's yeah. their RASCAP domain function. Okay. And then you had one slide that said not KO, knockout. And yes. I didn't quite understand. Was that, the, was that a homozygous? Patient mutant, or is that what is, what is the knockout? So the knockout, um, so knockout uh, in the mice, it's a knockout mutation that is targeted to a precise spot in the mouse's genome to prevent the gene of interest functioning. Okay, so it's oh, and she's saying homozygous deletion in mouse. So that's not the knockout is not a het. The knockout's no. a homozygous. Um, 
sort of larger deletion that probably ends in a not in a stop. So it's just kind of knocked out. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then can you go to the slide that um, it didn't show the socks. It showed socks too, but it showed another thing. I think it was like G, what was that called? This slide? Um, um, no, I wrote it in the, I wrote it in the chat here. Uh, oh no, I didn't because then I asked you, I wrote it in my, it's one before that. Yeah, the TJP, uh, two, two before um, that. The, uh, tight junction. Yeah, this one. Um, yeah, so, so, mm -hmm. so can you describe again, just like those, um, I kind of understand the SOX2 and the SYNGAP, so, but the TJP1 on the top uh, mm -hmm. left, mm -hmm. the top left TJP1. So TJP1, um, that is a marker for the tight junction protein. So the tight junction protein um, uh, establishes a link between the transmembrane protein, oclidin, and the actin cytoskeleton. Um, so, uh, as oclidin is a, uh, it plays a critical role in maintaining the barrier, barrier properties of tight junction, and actin cytoskeleton is important for maintaining the shape and structure of cells. Um, so, the TJP1 is just simply a marker for that protein. Okay, so in the, let's see, in the second row where it says TJP1 on the left and then mm -hmm. merged. And then there's these pretty blue, probably nuclei, and then the white, you know, instead of blow up, right? So you're mm -hmm. seeing nuclei. Are these glia or neurons? Uh, so the blue, uh, that's specifically DAPI, and DAPI just stands for all cells visible in the organoid. Yeah, so it's showing you the nuclei of all those cells. Mm -hmm. And then what's, and then this, this line is like blow up of one of these other lines in the, on the left, right? Uh, which one specifically are you talking about? Uh, right yeah, this, here? yeah, this white line, this white yeah. TJP1. So can yeah. you point to, oh, I, oh, I see. Okay, here's the little box in the merged one. Okay, yeah, that's where so it is. It's right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's looking, so the interior is like that sort of hole and then the exterior is where the cells are. Yes. And then you're showing that Syngap is in the same place. It's red and white in the same yes. place. Okay, that is very cool. So those are, that's basically like a whole bunch of cell surfaces that form a, uh, what would you call that? Sort of a barrier. Well, uh, uh, this would be considered like the ventricular zone. The ventricular zone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How, are you going to publish this? Uh, it's the. Uh, it's currently under review. Oh, um, congratulations! Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then is TJP one? Is that one of these proteins that's in like most cell types? Or in most, maybe not cell types, but most tissues. Do like do most tissues have it, or is it a neural, um, neural specific? That I am not entirely sure on. I don't want to give you the wrong answer. Yeah. Um, so I'm not entirely confident in in answering that question. That's okay. Great. Thank you so much. That's really amazing. Yeah, and Ashley says it's in many tissues. Yeah. I like this picture here with Syngap in the middle with all these proteins that it goes to. I wonder if I could, are you gonna let us, oh, this is recorded so I can- Yes, this is recorded, yes. How did you get, well, you probably don't even know how that how you got that, but it, these are, I am assuming it's an interaction, an interaction map from like things that protein-protein interactions. I believe so, yes. Um, I, Ashley is in the chat, so. Those more specific questions, she's more capable of answering. I just don't want to give you the wrong answer. Yeah, well, uh, but here in the here in your diagram above, it mm -hmm. says PDZ ligand. The, mm -hmm. the PDZ domain ligand domain is in the Syngap one, and then T, TJP one has all these PDZ domains, right? So you can see that makes sense. Either Sarah or for anybody else here, is this the work that SRF helped fund with postdocs in this lab? Uh, I should know that. Um, uh, this work specifically, I don't, I'm not sure, um, but the, on my last slide, or my well, we second the Koba lab, slide, but this is the yeah. Quadrado lab, yeah, um, oh, Dr. Koba's name there, oh. um, there is an SRF grant, part, yeah, Ashley said this, uh, experiment, okay, partially, okay. partially okay. funded by SRF, um, but 
the next project that we're working on pertaining to SYNGAP uh, is through an SRF grant, um, which is going to be headed by our postdoc in the lab, Marcella. And what, pro what will that project consist of? So it's uh, trying to better understand SYNGAP-1 interactors and progenitors. Uh, and uh, screening will be performed in early human cortical progenitors derived from SYNGAP-1 patients with different pathogenic variants. Um, and these results will enable the stratification of SYNGAP-1 mutations according to their effects on human cortical neurogenesis and potentially help guide for, the, for future therapeutic approaches. And what, so this has anything to do with the organoids or not? This is when, um, sorry, uh, cortical progenitors are... Yeah, so it does have to do with organoids, yes. It does, okay. So you're using, you're building on the work that you did with the organoids. I thought it was really interesting that the, um, the angle of the cell division changed and that they kind of matured faster. Um, Cause you see that in the synapses too, that the synapses kind of mature faster. So it seems like the haploinsufficiency kind of makes things mature faster. Is that, uh, that sounds like, is that a good, well, I don't know, that's just an abnormal thing, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. Harris, <laughs> yeah, no, you don't want it to mature too fast. You want it to okay. have time to, have to grow or experience something or change or okay. yeah. Yeah. you don't want it to, so you don't want it to be set in stone too quickly. And okay. also if it's because that with the, the angle of division, she showed it was, um, when it, when it matured, it stopped being a stem cell, right? Or at least one of them stops being a stem cell. Mm -hmm. Is that right, Sarah? Yeah. So let me go back to the slide specifically you're talking about, um, it's this one right here. So after it, it, it becomes um, differentiative and then it just uh, differentiates into more mature neurons rather than self-renewing. So would the oblique and horizontal, would both of them differentiate or just the top, just the top one that's away from, is it, is it contact with the luminal space that keeps it yeah. in this sort of self-renewing yeah. division? Okay. So the one cell that's still touching the, that luminal space and that's right where the where the TJ one yeah the, the tight junction protein one right at yeah. the ventricular wall yeah and syngap are expressed so once that once the cell loses contact with that it's going to go off and differentiate hmm. I'm really enjoying the conversation mostly because it's helping me learn more but also because of the question that Sandy asked and whether or not our efforts towards funding uh, the research uh, included this presentation. And I was glad to hear that um, <clears throat> it is including the work and the work that is to come. And so that gives us hope that we will understand even more in the future. Mm. And then also that what we are doing is uh, for a good cause and that we are working with people who are on the same page with us. And we should be very grateful that um, people are looking into this and that SYNGAP is as much on the map as it is currently. That's true. Yeah, with people who, with people know, who know what to do with it. <laughs> Know how to study it. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions or something you want to say to Sarah or JR or um, Ashley? Well, I would like yeah. to say thanks again, Sarah. This was Thank an you amazing for having me. presentation and um, opportunity for us to learn more. And um, I appreciate all the hard work that you put into this and uh, the work of your colleagues as well. And on uh, behalf of SRF and myself, uh, keep doing what you're doing and um, we'll be behind you 100%. Right.
I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. If you guys want to hang out and just talk, you can. But otherwise, that's the conclusion of that presentation. So thank you guys for coming tonight.